Members then are Deputy Smith, O'Connell, Coppinger, Tobin, Nolan and McGrath. So, Deputy Smith. Yeah, thank you. Um, unlike Deputy Murphy, I wouldn't be concerned that we'd have a lot of resignations over this. I actually have huge faith in the doctors in this country to deliver this service. Um, and I want to come back to the, uh, the, the ones that are publicly and vocally objecting and to ask you some questions about it. But um, I think there's been, in the medical services in this country, when they're allowed, there has been a great tradition of being on the side of women. So uh, back in Ballyfermot in the 60s and 70s and 80s, there was a notorious doctor called Paddy Leahy, who's now passed away, who was absolutely brilliant at breaking the law and giving women who 12 and 14 children access to contraception when it was totally illegal, as did Dr. Andrew Wynn mm -hmm. uh, face down the law over the, the, the question of um, condoms and, other, and the, the contraceptive pill. Mm -hmm. And Doctors for Choice have play, played an, an amazing role in delivering the, the result we have. Um, and there were other doctors in the 90s when it was not popular or profitable or anything else to promote abortion services who really uh, stuck their neck out. So I'm not worried at all that we're going to lose medical practitioners over this. I do agree that choice was what won the referendum. And I do agree that doctors should have the choice and anybody else, nurses and all, have, should have the choice. But the thing is, the, whole, the, the issue then is what happens uh, if um, a medical practitioner says, I, I conscientiously object, and, and then what next? And I think that that is an important issue. Um, because transfer of care could mean, here's the phone number for the 24-7 helpline, off you pop, or what I think it should mean is that as an employee or somebody who works for the HSE or on behalf of the HSE, that everyone who does meet a woman who's in crisis pregnancy and asks for the appropriate help, they are obliged because of the contract the HSE has with them and ultimately the HSE are obliged to ensure that she gets that care. And how we put that into the law really matters. I'm, I, I want to leave the possibility open of putting in a different kind of amendment when we get to the next stage on the question of the ultimate responsibility line with the HSE themselves rather than the doctor. But I can see hard cases here. And this kind of law may not deal, as, as it's written, may not deal with the hard cases. Transfer of care, if it is interpreted as just picking up a phone with a free phone helpline 24-7, will do nothing, for, for example, for, a, 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 and I know th this sort of case has been mentioned over and over, but it deserves to be mentioned, for a young woman from direct provision or from a marginalised community who all she knows is that's the doctor's clinic, I'm going down there, and maybe is so um, impeded by the use of language, inability to speak English, no money to make phone calls, or anything, any sort of a case could come up, and is not, it's not possible for that young woman to um, independently look for the help outside of that doctor's clinic. So I think we need to be careful that we don't create hard cases. Having said that, I'm pretty confident that most of our medical practitioners wouldn't be that hard-hearted or cruel as to see somebody walk away in a desperate state, but there may be some out there, and we shouldn't allow for any possibility of that. So we need to look at how we frame it. And that's why we've put in... Um, We've put in a, a clause to, to say that they, they must refer on, but we don't, don't think we use that language, but the transfer of care is, is the duty of the doctors. I, as I say, I want to look at putting in a future amendment on it being the ultimate responsibility of the HSE. Um, as a corollary to the amendment that um, it was introduced by um, the deputy here, what's his name? Toby. Yeah, Deputy Tobin, to allow an institution the access to conscientious objection. We have a different amendment in, number 162, which would actually insist that an institution doesn't have access to conscientious objection by inserting into subsection 1, um, sorry, no, insert into sub subsection 1, uh, that nothing in sub subsection 1 should be construed as applying to an institution, a hospital, or a medical facility. Now, we could do with that, we could leave that out, but we want to see it in as an absolute guarantee that there will be no uh, ability for somewhere like Vincent's Hospital, for example, to be able to say we refuse abortion care here because we have a Catholic ethos.
There are people out there at the moment terrified that our future National Maternity Hospital is going to be able to have that facility. We want it written into abortion legislation that they don't. And I think that's a reasonable uh, request if what the Minister is saying, I take in, in, what he's saying in good faith, is that includes institutions, hospitals and clinics. And um, the last thing I'd just like to ask the Minister a question about the, um, the um, alleged 600 and something doctors that are kicking up about this. Um, I have heard that many of them are unhappy because they, it's a question of the payment and the, the GP scheme and the payment to GPs in general. And Dr. Carty would obviously know about this. GPs lost a lot during austerity. The, I, I think the pay cuts, the, the dispute ranges between 26 to 36 percent um, of payments were lost to them during years of austerity and haven't been restored. Now, I can imagine that quite a cohort of them would be annoyed that they've now been asked to take on extra work without being um, remunerated for it correctly. You can clarify for me if that's correct or not. I don't imagine there's 600 and odd saying, no way, I'm not going to give out the abortion bill. I'd imagine if there are 600 at all, it contains a malcontent about pay. Can I that one specifically? Yes. So, so Deputy Smith is entirely correct that obviously GPs will have to be remunerated for this. There's a broader piece about general practice, which I'm not going to get into today, but the Chair and I are very familiar with it. But it does relate to the GP contract talks that are going on between my department and the IMO with a scheduled date of completion agreed by both sides of the end of the year, which is to address the entire issues you've referenced in terms of the sustainability of general practice, where we want it to be in the future, and how we're going to resource it. Broader issue. On the specific issue, in relation to resourcing GPs to provide this service, this specific new service. Um, I believe in the coming days, uh, in the coming days, and I can't say more than that today, but in the coming days we will be in a